In the last two lectures, we've been talking about decision making. And in particular, we've been talking about how rational or how logical are human beings. Well, it turns out that maybe we're not quite as rational and logical as we might have thought. But at the same time, it turns out that there may be good reasons for that. Part of that has to do with accuracy effort trade-offs. Maybe it's worth sacrificing a little accuracy to save a lot of effort. And that's why we use mental heuristics. It also turns out that our ability to evaluate logical propositions is highly modulated by whether they are social in nature. In both cases, we can sort of see an underlying evolutionary explanation for why there are limitations to our rationality. So that's what I want to talk about in this lecture. I want to talk more specifically about humans and human cognition in the context of evolution. You might have wondered why I've been wearing this shirt with a bonobo on it. This is my favorite non-human primate, Kanzi who is a very intelligent bonobo, who was raised by a researcher named Sue Savage Rumbaugh, and he was taught how to use a symbol manipulation board to communicate with human beings. And Kanzi is really cool to me because he shows the ways in which we are maybe more similar to our primate relatives than we sometimes might think. They may have more capacity for the kinds of cognition that we do than we normally give them credit for. It may just be down to the fact that they live in an environment where those types of cognition are not very useful. Of course, they are nowhere near our level. They, the complexity of the computations they can perform is very limited. But it's always surprising to see that maybe the line that divides us isn't quite so defined. We have found that after all, there isn't a sharp line dividing humans from the rest of the animal kingdom. It's a very wuzzy line. It's getting wuzzier all the time as we find animals doing things that we, in our arrogance, used to think was just human. Humans are an evolved species like every other organism on this planet. And that means that our minds are also an evolved structure. How can that fact inform our study of the mind? Well, we share a lot of our cognition with other primates. And so our evolutionary history and the study of our primate relatives can tell us a lot about our own cognition. Before we get too deep in this, I just want to go over some quick facts about evolution as a little refresher. There are a few important concepts that we need to make sense of in order to make sense of evolution. The first is variation. This is the idea that within a population of organisms that traits will vary. And variation is caused by random mutation. Mutations can be good, they can be bad, they can be neutral, but they are random. So in any given population of organisms, there will be some amount of variation. They will be different from each other in small ways because of those random mutations. And those traits, those variable traits, are heritable. Offspring will inherit the traits of their parents. And those traits, of course, are caused by random mutation. So there will be just random variation that is passed down from generation to generation. And the environment is exerting a selection pressure on organisms. So mutations that make survival difficult or mutations that make reproduction difficult are less likely to be passed on and mutations that make survival easier or make reproduction more likely are more likely to be passed on. And some mutations have no effect on the likelihood of survival or reproduction whatsoever. They're just neutral. It's worth remembering that evolution is a blind mechanism. These are just random mutations. Organisms are not changing in particular ways to meet specific goals. They're just changing completely at random. And those changes will either benefit them or not. So it's that combination of random mutation causing variation plus environmental pressure and selection that results in organisms having very specific traits that seem very well suited for very specific environments. Remember, evolution is a blind, mostly random process. Mutations are random. 
lots of traits are going to slip through that environmental filter. And it's even possible that some traits are just byproducts of something else that was favored by the environment. The biologist Stephen Jay Gould called these spandrels. Well, what's a spandrel? A spandrel in architectural terms is actually just a space between arches. When you have two arches near each other, there will be a little triangular space between them. And in the Middle Ages, architects would use that empty space and they would put elaborate decorative designs. And you can go to a cathedral now and look at the spandrels and say, wow, they're so beautiful. They're so well designed. You might think that the cathedral was built with those in mind. It was built around the spandrels. But actually, it's the opposite. The spandrels are an afterthought. They just sort of slipped through. The spandrels are just empty space between the features that the architect actually cared about, which are the arches. This is sort of contrary to an old idea about evolution that everything has its place and everything will have evolved for a very specific purpose to meet a very specific goal. There's a character named Pangloss in Voltaire's Candide who says, everything is made for the best purpose. Our noses were made to carry spectacles, so we have spectacles. Legs were clearly intended for breeches and we wear them. Of course, he gets the logic exactly backwards. It's spectacles that are made for our noses, not our noses being made for spectacles. So this is something important to think about when we think about evolution. We want to think about why certain traits were selected for. Certain traits are going to be very well suited for certain environments, and so they will pass that selectional filter. Other traits may have no immediate function or use. They just sort of slip through. They're not selected against. And some traits may be co-opted from other traits. We've already seen evidence of this when we talked about brain plasticity, that in blind people, the occipital lobe can actually wind up doing language processing. So that's happening at a very small scale, not an evolutionary scale. But now we should ask the question whether we see similar things happening on a much longer timeline. Do we see certain structures in the brain being co-opted for other purposes? So are elements of human cognition spandrels? Are they accidental byproducts of some pressure applying to some other trait? I think we have to consider the possibility that this is true, at least for certain cognitive functions. So we know that evolution applies to physical traits, but what about cognitive traits? With physical traits, there's a more obvious connection to adaptation to the environment. Organisms take on physical traits that allow them to obtain resources like food and water, or to catch prey, or to avoid predators, all depending on the kind of environment in which they live. And of course, features like legs and wings and fins are optimized for certain kinds of locomotion, for getting around in different kinds of environments. But it's less obvious how mental traits connect directly to our survival. Why do we even need such complex cognitive processing architecture? If we think of what humans are capable of, the types of things that we do now, building skyscrapers and flying to the moon, obviously these are not things that we evolved to do. No organism would evolve specifically for those goals. They're not really necessary for our survival. So why have we so overshot in terms of the necessary cognitive architecture to survive? our brains consume a tremendous amount of energy. So in a sense, it's a huge liability to our survival. There must be some benefit to having such large brains and being able to perform such complex computations. Okay, but before we talk about human beings, I wanna look at cognition in some other animals and see how it's affected by heritability and selection. One cool example of this is bird migration. Bird migration routes are genetically encoded. They're not learned. Birds are just born knowing where they're supposed to go. So this means that birds have mental representations of the route that they're gonna fly. And it means that the encoding of those maps is genetically encoded. Okay, so there's two populations of Swainson's thrushes in Western Canada. And each of them follows a different migration route. Sometimes those two populations interact and interbreed with each other, and that results in hybrid thrushes. Remember, the migration routes are genetically encoded. 
So if there's a genetic code for one migration route and there's a genetic code for the other migration route and two of those birds reproduce with each other, which route will the hybrid birds take? What kind of genetic route are they going to be endowed with? Well, researchers actually observed those hybrid thrushes with tracking equipment and they tracked to see where they would go, which migration route they would take. So if you look at this map, you can see the black lines are birds from those two populations, the two populations of Swainson's thrushes. And the colored lines are the hybrid birds. So what do we notice about this? Well, you can see right away the hybrid birds are taking sort of an intermediate route. And there's a lot higher variability. It's almost like they can't decide which route they should take. So the question is, what are these birds inheriting from their parents? Are they inheriting a mental representation? Is it even possible that evolution can act on specific mental constructs? From this case, it kind of seems like evolution is building a program for a mental representation. It's the mental representation itself that's being genetically encoded. It's that migration route. How is that actually represented? I mean, it sounds like some kind of mental map. You remember earlier when we talked about Tolman's rats and the way that they navigated those mazes using mental maps. It sounds like something similar might be happening with the Swainson's thrushes. But in this case, it could be that the map is genetically hardwired. And maybe that map is just made more permanent and more complex over successive generations. Could be that the process of natural selection itself is operating on mental representations. Okay, let's think about human beings and how our cognitive abilities evolved. Well, humans evolved into our modern form about two million years ago in Africa. And that environment exerted a selection pressure. So the traits that made survival easier in that environment would pass the selectional filter. The question is, what traits would have helped early humans survive in that environment? We call that environment the environment of evolutionary adaptation. It's believed that that's the period of time during which many of our psychological and cognitive mechanisms evolved during the Pleistocene, which began approximately two million years ago. So that constitutes our environment of evolutionary adaptation, the Pleistocene in East Africa. And in that environment of evolutionary adaptation, humans were cursorial hunters. These are the sand people of the Kalahari Desert, the last tribe on earth to use what some believe is the most ancient hunting technique of all, the persistence hunt. They run down their prey. This was how men hunted before they had weapons, when a hunter had nothing more than his own physical endurance with which to gain his prize. Running on two feet is more efficient over long distances than running on four. A man sweats from glands all over his body and so cools himself. A kudu sweats much less and has to find shade if it's to cool down. And a man has hands with which to carry water, so during the chase he can replenish the liquid he loses as sweat. The chase has lasted eight hours. Hunter and hunted are both at the end of their strength. Neither can go on much longer. Then the kudu collapses from sheer exhaustion. So our original mode, the mode that human beings inhabited in that environment, was hunting animals by running them to exhaustion. And that means that humans had to be very good at running in order to hunt. 
And it was things like sweat glands and bipedalism that made that strategy viable. So those very specific physiological traits enabled us to pursue that lifestyle in that environment. But if we think about what else would be useful in that environment, what else would be useful for a cursorial hunter living in East Africa during the Pleistocene? What cognitive traits would have been beneficial? Well, spatial reasoning would be very important. It would help us navigate. Memory and categorization would help us to identify objects, edible fruits. And communication would have been crucial. The ability to communicate, coordinate our efforts, plan ahead. Even having social structures and maintaining social relationships would have been incredibly important. These traits would complement human survival strategy, including how they hunted and lived in groups. Remember, humans are highly social animals. We actually have a special term for this. It's called eusocial. Humans are eusocial, and so are certain insects, like ants and bees. We live in very complex, hierarchical societies with lots of members and lots of relationships, and we cooperate and coordinate our activities constantly. Of course, we're not the only social primates. There are a lot of primates with complex social structures. Chimpanzees live in troops. Gorillas live in tribes. Baboons live in very complex, hierarchically organized societies. And they have to have a very good memory for their relationship with every other baboon in their tribe. They have to remember not only who everyone is, but at what level, what specific relationship you have with every other member of the hierarchy. There's one more element of our environment of evolutionary adaptation that would be very useful to model with mental representations. So of course we would be modeling our environment, we would be modeling edible plants, we would be modeling animals and their behavior. But there's one other thing in that environment that is useful for us to model. And that is other minds. We all model the outside world via mental representations. But we also have a range of internal representations. Emotional states, beliefs, language. So we also have to model the internal mental states of other human beings. This is really important in order to maintain status and cooperate successfully. We need good models of other people's minds. We wouldn't be able to cooperate very well if we couldn't in some way unify and coordinate our behaviors by thinking as one. And that's the basis of theory of mind, the modeling of the minds of other organisms. A theory of mind is a theory of what it means to be someone else, to see the world from their perspective to understand their mental states. And that guides our behavior when we are interacting with other people. So it's a very important part of how we operate socially. You're gonna have a tea party with Play-Doh. I'm gonna serve myself. Here's Sarah. No! Well, you've probably discovered that however smart your three-year-old is, she doesn't seem able to put herself in someone else's mental shoes to imagine how they think and what they believe. Perhaps you thought your parenting skills were to blame, but scientists suggest that understanding other minds is a skill that may not be fully developed until a child is about four. To learn how children's social skills evolve between about three and four, researchers use something called a false belief test. What do you think's in this box? Looks fairly obvious, doesn't it? Crayons. But let me show you. I filled it full of candles, all right? Now I close it up again. While you and I have been having this conversation, Snoopy has been down here asleep. Doesn't know what we've talked about. But let's bring him into the conversation. Now I have another question for you. What do you think Snoopy will say if I ask him what's in this box? Crayons, obviously. What else could anybody possibly say? Well, watch this three-year-old. Inside this box. Okay, let's open it up and see. Candles. Now, you can ask the child what appears to be a very simple question about that. What did you think was inside the box when you first saw it? They say, Oh, I always thought that there were candles in this box. Then you can ask them about someone else. So you can ask them about Snoopy. Snoopy's been sitting here. He hasn't seen this box, he's never seen us open it up. What does Snoopy think is inside this box? Uh, candles. 
children say the same thing. Snoopy will think there are candles inside of his box. And what that indicates is that the children's view of how minds work is very, very different from the view that you and I would have. Yes, did you see it? In the mind of the three-year-old, everyone sees the world much the same way. There's no difference between what I think and believe and what everyone else, including Snoopy, thinks and believes. It is, in a sense, a naive and innocent view of the world, a kind of mental Eden. And then, about four, comes the fall from grace. Now, if you take a four-year-old, quite typically, the four-year-old will tell you that, as a matter of fact, he thought there were crayons in the box, and then he found out that there were candles in the box. You can ask him about Snoopy, and he'll say, oh, no, Snoopy will think that there are crayons in this box. Great. Why will he think that? Because it's a crayon box. Mm-hmm. That's right. And that's going to make him think there are crayons. What's really in the box? Candles. Right. And then you get the five-year-olds who are just utterly blasé and think that this is such an obvious thing, it's silly even to ask the question. What that shows is that by the time children are four and five, they have a view of the mind that looks much more like our view of the mind. They understand that things can be tricky and deceptive, that you can change your mind, that things aren't always the way that they seem. And that gives them a very different vision of how the mind works and how people work. Remember, we're sharing this. Oh, I need that. And then it's my turn. Children who pass the false belief test now understand that other people can have different beliefs, even mistaken beliefs. Some scientists suggest that this test is further evidence of innate brain circuits specialized for reading other people's minds. They call it a theory of mind mechanism. What about other animals? Do animals have theory of mind? They can't really do the false belief task, right? Because it requires communication. You have to be able to say what you think another person is thinking. So we can't really do that with animals. But there are other ways that we might infer whether animals have a theory of mind. The Western scrub jay hides food in scattered caches in their territories. So that requires accurate complex memory in order for them to remember all of the locations where they stored their food. And it also shows the ability to plan. Some scrub jays will actually steal acorns that they have watched other jays hide. So if they can see where they've been hidden, they can go back and steal them later. Scrub jays can only defend their caches against subordinate birds. They also have a kind of hierarchical social structure. And if a more dominant, stronger bird knows where they've hidden their food, that stronger, more dominant bird can take what they want. Jays will often re-hide their food if they notice that a dominant jay is watching them. Because they know that that dominant jay may be able to steal their food in the future. Now what makes this really interesting is that only the birds who have had the experience of stealing, only birds who have themselves stolen before, display this behavior. So what does this indicate? Does it indicate that the scrub jay has some kind of theory of mind? It seems they have a theory of mind of sorts. They can learn and gain an intuitive understanding of what another jay's intentions are. But does that mean that the scrub jay is modeling the mental states of other birds? The fact that they only rehide if they themselves have stolen seems to imply that they're mapping their own intentions onto other birds, right? If you're modeling intent, then it's some understanding of the mental state of another person, or in this case, another bird. And they only know that that's a possible intention or a possible mental state because they themselves have experienced it. Maybe they can only model an intent that they have already experienced themselves. So theory of mind is a very important aspect of our cognition with respect to how we operate socially. We've already seen that our ability to reason logically is constrained by social cognition. And here's another example, theory of mind, where social cognition leads to a very specific set of cognitive abilities. And this leads us to a question about human intelligence in general. How did human intelligence develop? Why are we so intelligent? There are other intelligent animals on this planet. Dolphins and whales. Corvids are very intelligent. Other primates like chimpanzees. But humans are more intelligent than any other life form on this planet. 
Why is that? Why are we so intelligent? Is our more general intelligence bootstrapped off of social intelligence? Or is it the reverse? Maybe the reason that we're so good at social cognition is because we have very good general intelligence. But it could also be the case that our general intelligence, the reason we are so intelligent in general, is because we have a very strong need in our evolutionary environment to navigate complex social structures. Maybe our general intelligence is a byproduct of our social intelligence. So there are two hypotheses here about the evolution of human intelligence. The cultural intelligence hypothesis says that social intelligence preceded general intelligence. The general intelligence hypothesis, naturally, says that general intelligence preceded social intelligence. But how can we test these two hypotheses? Do they make different predictions? Well, let's think about the development of children. Intelligence is something that develops over time. The question is, do all areas of intelligence develop at a similar rate? So if we think about children, we want to see how fast different types of intelligence develop. And if certain aspects of our cognition develop faster, or if they are present from an earlier age, that would be indicative of something that is more basic, something that maybe evolved earlier, something that was very important for our survival in our environment of evolutionary adaptation. Let's consider two broad types of intelligence. Physical intelligence consists of things like spatial reasoning, being able to place things in space, mentally rotate objects, model objects three-dimensionally in your mind, a sense of number or a sense of quantity, being able to tell how many things there are in a certain place, knowledge of causality, the idea that if something happens, it will affect something else, and that something happens, it must have a cause, and object permanence, the idea that things continue to exist even if you can't see them. These are all aspects of our cognition that at least take some time to develop. On the other hand, we have social intelligence. That consists of things like communication. We use language, but there are also other forms of communication as well. And theory of mind. These also take time to develop. So let's compare the abilities of our primate relatives and human children. What we might expect is that if the cultural intelligence hypothesis is true, there shouldn't really be a difference between children and non-human apes in terms of physical intelligence, but there should be a difference in terms of social intelligence. If social intelligence is more basic for human beings, if it evolved first, that should be the thing that differentiates us from other apes. And we should see that reflected in the development of human children. On the other hand, the general intelligence hypothesis might say that the difference between children and apes should be apparent in every type of intelligence. The thing that separates us from other apes is not our social intelligence specifically, it's just that we have very high general intelligence. So our children, human children, should develop much faster in every area. And we should see a big difference between human children and non-human primates. A study in 2009 found something kind of surprising. When children, chimpanzees, and orangutans were tested in physical and social domains, what was found is that human children have very similar abilities in terms of their physical intelligence. Things like sense of number and causality and object permanence, it's not very different for human children and non-human apes. Where we see a big difference is in social intelligence, in the social domain, human children are significantly better than chimpanzees and orangutans, even at a very young age. So in the social domain, humans may have more of an advantage over other primates compared to the physical domain where there is not much of a difference. And this is pretty clear support for the cultural intelligence hypothesis, the idea that social intelligence preceded general intelligence in our evolutionary history. Social intelligence, for human children develops faster than general intelligence, which includes physical intelligence. So does that mean that social cognition was the precursor to general intelligence in humans? And if so, does that mean that our general intelligence was shaped around our social needs? Well, what we've seen before, the ways in which our social cognition constrains our ability to logically reason, it seems that that's true. There are many areas of our cognition 
that are in some ways constrained by our social cognition or by the social realities of our environment of evolutionary adaptation. The social structures that we had to navigate in that environment still shape our cognition today. Let's go over the key concepts from this lecture. We talked about evolution and natural selection. And we talked specifically about how that might apply to human beings and to our cognition. We talked about spandrels, the idea that there may be some traits that are just unintended byproducts or side effects of other traits that were actually selected for, things that slip through the cracks. And the idea that this may apply to certain areas of human cognition. We talked about our environment of evolutionary adaptation in the Pleistocene in East Africa. And we talked about the specific types of cognition that may have been useful for us in that environment. One of those types of cognition was theory of mind, the ability to model what other people are thinking. And we talked about the evolution of intelligence and whether our general intelligence preceded our social cognition or whether social cognition was a necessary precursor for us becoming the most intelligent species on this planet.